Lakeland PBS, the Bemidji Pioneer, Brainerd Dispatch, Park Rapids Enterprise, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2022, a look at our area legislative candidates. Your moderator tonight is Bethany Wesley. And now, the House District 2A debate. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second night of Debate Night 2022 at the Lakeland PBS studio in Bemidji. I'm Bethany Wesley, your moderator for tonight. We're continuing an exciting week of debates with the second of three state legislative debates tonight, covering topics and issues that are important to you and your communities. Tonight for House District 2A, we have candidates, Re Representative Matt Grossel from the Republican Party and Reed Olson from the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. Our panelists are Dennis Wyman, Lakeland PBS News Director, Heidi Holton, National Public Radio Affiliate, KAXE News Director, and Nicole Ronchetti, Bemidji Pioneer Reporter. The rules for the debate are, each candidate will have three minutes for opening comments. The panel will then ask questions. Some will be their own questions, others may come from the public. The candidates will rotate the order they speak, beginning with opening comments and finishing with closing comments. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question. Each candidate will also have a one minute rebuttal or time for additional comments thereafter. Candidates will have the option of using one minute of bonus time to add on to one of their answers tonight. This can be used during the initial question or during the time for additional comments, but it can only be used once. Questions will continue until we're about 50 minutes into the debate and then we'll move on to closing comments. Closing comments will be two minutes. So we'll get started with opening comments. Again, you have three minutes for opening comments. Opening first will be Matt. Thank you. And good, e good evening, everyone. And thank you all for being here. And thank you for the invitation to come here and uh, have this debate. Um, welcome, Reed. I'm glad you're here. And uh, just to start off, uh, a lot of you already know me. My name is Matt Grossel. I'm the current uh, representative for District 2A. Uh, some of you, uh, it's, this is uh, some new terrain due to the restructuring of the districts, uh, the past census. Uh, made us uh, have to redistrict a lot of areas and so uh, the terrain of the district has changed some. And so just to introduce myself to those who are new constituents or new to, new to the district, uh, again I said my name is Matt Grossel and I am a retired, or a retired deputy sheriff from Clearwater County. I'm a U.S. military veteran, honorably discharged, and also I am a uh, former small business owner who used to drive truck over the road. I'm a father and a grandfather and brother and uncle to a, a bunch of fine, fine uh, nephews and nieces. Uh, I guess my, my uh, opening would be that I have a long legacy of uh, a service to this country and to this state. My family has uh, served in the U.S. Armed Forces since uh, World War I to current. Uh, we have a very strong background in uh, law enforcement and to trying to keep our, our areas safe, trying to keep our neighbors safe. I spent uh, six years working on a Headwater Safe Trails and Narcotics uh, Task Force along with the Paul Budian Task Force and spent a lot of time working on the local, uh, the, th the three reservations in this district, Leech Lake, White Earth and Red Lake, and then also all of the counties in between where we did a lot of work to try to make sure that we uh, stopped the influx of drugs uh, caught those who were committing violent crimes and made sure that they were held accountable. We did this all the while the, trying to make sure that our, our, our neighbors and our own families and their families were, were safe. And we continued to do that and continued to strive for that. And so, you know, I just want to welcome people and I want you to know that uh, the name of this job is service. That is the focus of this job. And I take that to heart and I take that very serious. I have served for many years uh, the, the, the uh, military and law enforcement and now in this new capacity working in the legislature. My dedication to service to representing you has not stopped and it will not stop. So I welcome everybody and thank you for your time. Thanks Matt. Reed. Well, thank you, Bethany. <clears throat> thank you, panel members. Uh, thank you, Lakeland Public uh, Television. 
and all the organizations that are sponsoring this forum. And thank you, Matt, for being here. I look forward to your questions, panel, and uh, thank you to those watching tonight. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak directly to the citizens of the House District 2A. It's a new district for many of the residents because of redistricting. Uh, about 51% of the district is, uh, is, is new. Um, it's new to Matt Grossel, but it's not new to me. Um, I've been part of this community for the better part of 30 years. Uh, the district now includes Lake of the Woods County, most of Clearwater County, uh, north of Bagley, uh, some of, of northern Beltrami County, all of Red Lake Nation, and the city of Bemidji. And I'm here today to ask for your vote. Um, my business experience, my elected office experience, and the life ex the, my life experience have prepared me well to be your voice in St. Paul. I grew up in a farm country in central Minnesota. I grew up in Litchfield. And I moved to Bemidji in 1994 to work, study, and play at the Concordia Language Villages. <clears throat> I stayed here because I love northern Minnesota. I have owned and operated a successful restaurant in Bemidji for 17 years. I've served on the Bemidji City Council, and I'm currently serving my second term on the Beltrami County Board. <clears throat> I am most proud of my work in the county, in the community, um, uh, assuring that the unhoused residents have a place, safe place to stay in the winter and that we can get them onto the path towards success. My work to establish an emergency overnight shelter in 2016 and the recent opening of the New Day Center in Bemidji are examples of how I've been working to make our community safer and more welcoming to all. All the shelter work, uh, at the shelter we work hand in glove with local law enforcement in efforts to improve public safety we also work with area tribes to help find stability for those that find their ways at our to our doors. I understand the challenges facing businesses, local governments, and nonprofits. I understand the, the struggles of school districts, higher ed, healthcare, and law enforcement. That's probably why I'm endorsed by our local teachers, our nurses, the Beltrami County Sheriff's deputies, the county jail uh, corrections officers and sergeants, BSU faculty, and the Red Lake Nation. Whether they are challenges of meeting a budget, finding employees, or providing affordable housing and daycare, I've been on the forefront of solving these issues for the better part of 20, 20 years. It's that kind of real world experience that we need in St. Paul. Thanks again to the sponsors and those turning, tuning in. I hope our cons cons Excuse me, I hope our conversation tonight will help you get to know me a little bit better, and I respectfully ask for your support on November 8th to be your voice in St. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. We will move into the question portion. So our first question will come from Dennis, and Reed will answer first. Okay. Thanks, Bethany. Thanks to both of you for joining us tonight for this debate here on Lakeland PBS. Uh, question on education. Are there any changes to the way we fund education in Minnesota or our education system that you would advocate for? Yeah, I think that uh, it's difficult right now where, you know, where the, the zip code in which you live has a lot to do with uh, the quality of education that you have. You know, Beltrami County, Lake of the Woods, Northern uh, Clearwater County, these aren't incredibly rich areas. You know, we, uh, we have a hard time raising enough revenues to pay for the services that we want to provide. Um, schools have a hard time passing referendums uh, to, to get the funding that they need. I think we can look at more uh, state dollars going towards education to make sure that regardless of where you live in Minnesota, you can get a quality education. And I also want to speak not just about funding education, but really about the importance of supporting our schools, supporting the people that work so hard at our schools, our teachers, our school boards, uh, making sure that we are are giving them the tools that they need and the support that they need to succeed because at the end of the day, making sure that our kids have quality education is gonna, is gonna set them for success in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. Matt. Thank you. You know, every student, deserves, every student deserves to be in a classroom and every student deserves a great education that prepares them for the opportunities after high school. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, things that we need to look at as far as doing better uh, for years, we've, we've poured money into schools only to see test scores remain flat and increase in, 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 an increase in controversial uh, curriculum that seems to be focused on political activism ra rather than uh, reading, writing, uh, math, and science. And those are some things that, uh, that need to be taken out of the way and get, 
get our educators back to making sure that our children are prepared for when they finish high school, to go out into the real world to face and to be able to pr be productive and to get jobs. And this is, you know, this is not only for, uh, not only for, uh, that to continue on into four-year schools or to college or of any kind, but also to tech schools, also to prepare them for uh, jobs in the trades, et cetera. So we need to, we need to put more funding towards uh, introducing, our, uh, introducing our kids at a young age to the, the tech schools, to the, the, trades, the, the trades jobs out there. Uh, there's a lot of, there's the, the, the trades are screaming for, for people to, uh, to come into those trades and there's some really, really great paying jobs and careers that students can get into coming right straight out of high school, get into the trades and start to get, uh, start to get that training to be able to, to grow in that. Now, and, to, and also to continue to you know, go into the four-year schools should they be called to that as well and get their education, proper education in there. You know, but one of the big things in, in our area in the, uh, in the uh, rural areas is transportation funding. The formula for that is so un imbalanced that it's, it's ridiculous when our rural schools have to dig into their general fund to cover transportation costs. So those are just a few of the things that I want to make sure that we work on as far as education goes. Thanks, Matt. Reed, do you have additional comments? Yeah, I'll say quickly, I agree that the per pupil funding when it comes to transportation needs to change. Um, I also just want to quickly say, oh, and, and the, um, the, the Bemidji High School has a great program called the Career Academy that does exactly that. And it's maybe something that other school districts could mimic where they give kids um, practical training uh, and kind of set them up for, for the trades, which is very important. Um, I also just quickly want to say that I, 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 I'm glad that, that uh, Matt mentioned um, people playing politics with our schools. You know, um, Matt has made a habit of, of going to the Gonvick, uh, the Clearbrook Gonvick School Board meetings over the last few um, months and, uh, or years, and I know has been basically terrorizing them. I know one person that quit the school board because she felt intimidated by him constantly coming in upsetting the, the, the meetings, uh, not abide, not, paying it, not be, being disruptive, and, um, and I find that really unfortunate. I think we need to support our, our school boards and our schools and not use them as a, as a platform to gain cheap political points. Matt? Well, <laughs> uh, if, you're going to, if you're going to attack someone's integrity, you should probably have the facts in line. Um, to go to a school board meeting to uh, when you're invited and to uh, be a voice of reason f among between parents and school board there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and that's exactly what I did but you know I'm not going to I, I'm not going to attack my opponent here uh, what we need is a we need a well-rounded curriculum focused on preparing kids for the skills and knowledge they need for the future controversial cur curriculum like CRT has no business being in the classroom we can teach America's history, the good and the bad, without trying to, uh, without trying to divide each other. And Minnesota Republicans support meaningful school choice and every student for, uh, to en and empower parents to make the best education choices for their children. That's where, that's where our, our efforts need to be. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Our next question comes from Heidi. The overturning of Roe versus Wade in July has left abortion law to the states. Doe versus Gomez in Minnesota ruled that the Minnesota Constitution protects a woman's right to have an abortion. What is your role as a legislator when it comes to women's reproductive health? Matt. I'll go first on that one. Thank you. You know, and we had this discussion uh, with, uh, with uh, oh gosh, I forget your name, I'm sorry. Nicole, I had this discussion on the phone with Nicole uh, just last week during a, during a telephone interview, and uh, there is there is no there is no easy way to have this discussion, and it shouldn't be. This is a, a, a tough discussion. Everybody knows that I am pro-life, from conception to death. I've never hidden that. I've always let people know this is where I stand on it. But the discussion on on uh, on abortion needs to be one that you come into with a soft heart, an open heart, and to listen. There needs to be, there needs to be uh, help for anybody 
who is, who, who is faced with an unplanned pregnancy and there needs to be good counseling all the way through that process. Now, you know, is abortion the only answer? Is abortion the answer? No, it's not the answer. Not as far as, not as, far as I'm concerned. And if you, if you ask 68% of Minnesotans, abortion uh, of, at any time is not, is, is not the solution. There are other solutions out there, and we should be looking at those. We need to help these, we need to help these uh, women who have these, un, these unplanned pregnancies or, or, by, or whatever happens there to work through this process to make sure they have all the options laid in front of them and to make sure that there are some, uh, there are some good options other than the, the termination of, of a child's life. So, you know, those are, again, they're not easy discussions. But those are the discussions that need to be had. And like I said, you had better come to it. You need to come to it with a soft heart and an open heart and listen to people and find common ground. That's where, where you can work from. Thanks, Matt. Reed. Yeah, I take reproductive rights very seriously. Um, I, I think I will mention, you know, um, Sanford Health is moving a lot of their, their reproductive um, health care from Fargo into Moorhead because of the strict laws that are happening in North Dakota and uh, don't think, think for a second that if um, if my friend here had his way uh, abort, abortion would be completely illegal in Minnesota you know we need to keep it safe legal and rare is something that I really believe in we need to give people the um, the, the resources that they need uh, and it is not it is much broader than just unwanted pregnancies or unexpected pregnancies there are many many reasons that um, people find themselves needing to, to have an abortion and now we are hearing some horror stories in other states of what happens when you try to um, vigorously restrict uh, women's access to, to um, reproductive health care. Uh, I will do everything I can to make sure that, that families have access to family planning, that they are able to live the be their best lives and uh, I am not going to get in the way of anyone's uh, relationship with their doctor. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. Matt, did you have a response or additional comments? You know, just the additional comments. Like I said, you know, 68% uh, of Minnesotans supported at least some limits on abortion. Um, only 43% wanted uh, want an outright ban on, on most abortions. Only 30.1% of Minnesotans want abortion to be legal without any limitations. And yet, uh, and yet uh, almost no pro-abortion pro candidates in Minnesota support limitations on abortion, making, theirs, making their, their stance the real extreme stance. Now, these are discussions that, that should be had between the, the woman and the doctor, and these are just some horrible, horribly difficult decisions that need to be made. They should never be taken lightly. And like I said, when you talk about this stuff, when you look at all of the circumstances. You need to have a soft heart and an open heart to really get, to get a hold of this subject. Thank you. Reed? Yeah, I believe 60% of rural Minnesota believes that Roe v. Wade should not have been overturned, and I guess that's kind of where I stand. Um, I don't have an extreme position on it. I believe that my position is right in the, uh, in the, in the majority of Minnesotans, in the majority of rural Minnesotans. Thank you, Reed. Our next question comes from Nicole. It's well known that there is an ongoing opioid crisis both in Minnesota and the rest of the country. Combine this with rising rates of mental health concerns and many people are left in dire straits. Despite this, there is also a shortage of treatment and care options for these people. How would you approach this issue in the legislature? And that's me. It's yep, <laughs> okay. Um, so as, uh, as I mentioned, I operate a homeless shelter and I am I say, I say sometimes that I'm on the front line of misery in Bemidji, and I see people that are struggling from, um, struggling with substance use disorder and struggling with, um, with uh, mental illness. And I think that we need to do what we, uh, everything we can to help people find the services that they need. Um, we, uh, we, um, excuse me, <laughs> we, uh, we have to, we, we have a lot of people that are, that are, struggling, we have a lot of people in pain, and when they slip through the track cracks, then we can see their quality of life really go down. If we can get people into treatment and get people the help that they need, 
then we can put them back on the track towards a more, towards a more successful um, life and uh, they can pull things together and, and hopefully move on. Thanks. Thanks, Reed. Matt. You know, you, you talk about the opioid crisis, the drug crisis, the fentanyl crisis, all of that. Um, a big part of that is we have a border that is left wide open on the south, in the south, and there is a massive funnel coming in. And guess where all of that stuff goes, you know? It, it gets funneled right up to the hub cities and gets funneled up into northern Minnesota, up into the reservations and the counties surrounding. So the, the opioid crisis, the narcotics crisis, is nothing new to us. It is something that has to be, it is something that has to be stopped and we've been working for a lot of years to stop that. Like I said, uh, I, worked for, I worked for six years on the, uh, the Paul Bunning and the Safe Trails uh, Narcotics Gangs, Guns and Violent Crimes Task Force. We got a lot of good work done and, and stopped a lot of uh, trafficking into this area, into the reservations and on into the counties. So the, the crisis and, the, and the, uh, the narcotics trafficking, they don't know boundaries, they don't know state lines, they don't care. All they want to do is sell their, get their product out there, get it into these communities and poison people. And that's something that we have all got to come together on and work on. There has been some good work done on the opioid crisis and it was bipartisan work and it was good work. And that's work that we can keep building on. If you want to uh, work, work on the mental health, well that's, that project has also been started. But that is, it, and both sides have learned, that is gonna be a daunting task. You know, having worked in the law enforcement field, I have run across for numbers of years uh, individuals that needed, that needed mental health help. They didn't need to go into a cell, but they needed mental health, mental health help. And so we would have to travel for miles, for miles. And, and being from a county that has one deputy on, you can't leave the county uncovered and un, unprotected while you, while you uh, have to take somebody for mental health issues to a play facility that can take them. We need more facilities to help these individuals to get back onto, get back onto their medications to get the help that they need. So that is something that we'll continue to work on in the legislature. Thanks, Matt. Read additional comments? Yeah, yeah, Matt is right. It is, we do not produce fentanyl in, in northern Minnesota. You know, it's brought in from outside. And we do need to see stronger partnership, I think, between some of the tribal law enforcement and local law enforcement to really try to root out the distribution and the, and the, and the intake. And we absolutely need more investment in, in mental health uh, and access to mental health care. Um, I see it all the time of people that are languishing on our streets, in our jails, uh, in the ER, at, at, at the hospital, that are trying to find uh, um, uh, treatment or, or, or um, doctors that just don't exist. We really need to try to bring more mental health professionals into, into the Bemidji area, into, uh, into Clearwater County, into Lake of the Woods County, because there are people suffering all over rural Minnesota, and we just don't have the we are starting to see it, I think, at the county level. We are definitely working on it, um, but there's a lot more to be done, and I definitely there's a state role to play to try to bring in more mental health um, uh, uh, capacity in, in our communities, and we definitely need to have more treatment options that are more local. Thanks, Reed. Matt? In our, our counties, cities, and our tribal uh, law enforcement agencies do work very well together. Uh, a lot of the smaller cities and counties when you have a task force such as we have in this area, it is a force multiplier. It, is, uh, it brings extra resources that you would not otherwise have to be able to fight crimes, investigate crimes that are plaguing our areas. And narcotics and narcotics trafficking, whether we like it or not, is here and it's been here. It's been here for a lot of years. But we have to make sure that our agencies have the resources to do those things. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our fourth question from Dennis. Do you feel it's time for substantial tax relief in Minnesota? If so, please detail specifically what you feel should be done. If, if you don't feel taxes should be lowered, please explain why you feel that way. Matt? <laughs> You're darn right I feel there's, that tax relief needs to be here. Uh, when, you have, uh, when you have such a large surplus, that tells you one thing, that our citizens are being overtaxed and those resources have to, those, those, those funds have to be, find their way back to the citizens. Uh, we tried to get a little bit of that work done last session, but it came at too high of a cost, it came at too high of a price for, uh, for our citizens. 
If you get uh, Social Security tax knocked out and you get some tax relief to people, but it's covered up and shadowed over by uh, billions of dollars of continued and permanent government spending and growing government, you're not helping anybody. You're not helping anybody. So this next, this, this next biennium, this next uh, session after this election, should it be elected, we are going to work on knocking out the Social Security tax, getting some tax cuts and tax breaks for uh, our, our working class, our working folks, and our small businesses to make sure that they have the money that, that uh, they need. And good Lord, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to get this uh, inflation under control, is something that really, really has to, that'll really help as far as the, as far as uh, getting our taxes under control as well. So, I mean, it's, it's high time we, we, we gave money back to the, back to the citizens. Like I said, when you have, when you have this much of a surplus, you're overtaxing your citizens and there's no reason for it. Thanks, Matt. Reed. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that our, our, Surplus is more a product of a, of, a, of a healthy economy than it is overtaxing. Um, if it was overtaxing, then we would have all of our roads would be in, in perfect shape. All of our schools would be adequately funded. We would have the metal, metal, mental health uh, assets that we need in our communities. Uh, Minnesota does have a higher than, than average uh, tax, tax levels, and those taxes have given us a great uh, education system, the most productive workforce in the country, and more Fortune 500 companies per capita than any other state in the union. If our taxes were too high for companies to invest in us, they would all be in Mississippi, but here they are in Minnesota. You know, um, I support eliminating the Social Security tax. I think that the surplus will make that possible. I think that we will, that there will be good value in trying to retain our, our elders. I know a lot of people, including some family members of mine, that leave the, leave the state when they retire uh, for tax purposes. But I will say that as a county commissioner, I get worried anytime I hear legislators talking about cutting taxes, because usually they are talking about cutting taxes for major corporations and very wealthy people. So if you want to give tax cuts to, to the wealthy people in Edina, you can do that, but when I hear a tax cut at the state level, as a commissioner, I think the property taxes are gonna go up. Because unless the services that we are providing, that we are mandated to provide, unless we stop providing those services, we will have to levy through property taxes to be able to make that difference. So I think we need to be very, very careful when we talk about blanket tax cuts. Because I think that the tax cuts that, that Matt is talking about will benefit the corporations and the wealthiest of us. In fact, if we really wanna lower taxes, for the average person in, in our community, I would support a marginal increase in the top tier earners in our, in our, uh, in our state and the, the wealthiest or the best uh, the, um, corporations. And then we can use that money to increase local government aid to cities and county program aid to counties so they can lower their, rev, their, their levies and give you real tax relief through a reduction in property taxes. Thanks, Reed. Matt, do you have additional comments? <laughs> I do, okay. I do. Um, the, the comment about the, the economy is good, look around you folks, look around you. Go to the gas pump, highest, uh, highest the gas has ever been for, for many years. Uh, they try to tell you, oh, it's coming down some. Well, that's because it went up so far and they've tapped into our, our, uh, our emergency reserves and now it's climbing back up again. They not only tapped into our emergency reserves, is, is that dangerous, it has, left us, it, it has left us vulnerable, and we cannot have that. But the taxes, the, the prices are going up, the groceries are, are, are skyrocketing, and it's hard to find, it's hard to find uh, parts or get parts for vehicles. Tell me this economy is good, folks. Tell me the economy is good. And I'll tell you what, this, is, this has been the, the DFL disconnect to rural Minnesota all along. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Reed. I am a small business owner in Bemidji. I have been for 17 years. I know the challenges that small businesses face. I know that inflation is real, but to, to say that cutting taxes to our, our wealthiest people and our best, uh, our, our best performing corporations it is not something that we should be doing right now. We have money right now in this surplus that we can invest in Minnesota, in Minnesotans, and that's what we should do. But to use one-time dollars to try to fund ongoing tax cuts is incredibly irresponsible. 
Thanks, Reed. Thank Our next question comes from Heidi. Minnesota has been number one in voter turnout in the country for many years. Do you trust Minnesota's election system? If you have questions about it, let us know specifically. Reed? Uh, the short answer is no. We are Minnesota. We have the best election system in the country. We are the gold standard. Just today, uh, I was at a county board meeting, the Beltrami County Board meeting, before coming here to this debate. And uh, we were talking about the processes that we follow um, for our elections. Um, we are, we continually audit ourselves after elections and recounts have shown just how safe our elections are. We should not let politicians make uh, hay out of getting us to be afraid of our election system. It's been building for a few years now and I think it's very dangerous to, uh, to, to try to plant these seeds of doubt that our election system is anything but top notch. Are there some mistakes sometimes? Can people commit fraud? Yes, they can, but it's a felony, and it's very, very rare. Our elections are safe and secure, and, uh, and I, have my, I have the full confidence in them. I've been a, a poll um, worker myself, and so I've been there and watched the process. We have paper ballots for everything. It is, it is impossible to quit, steal an election in Minnesota. The elections are fair, they are auditable, there's a paper trail. We should be very proud. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. Matt. You know, if you ask, uh, if you ask in 2016, if you ask presidential candidate Hillary Clinton if our elections are, are fair, she would tell you no, they weren't. Uh, and that's uh, something that's going to come back to bite you every time. In uh, yeah, 2020, there were there some things that were going on. Yeah, you know, there's, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, there's investigations. Apparently, there's. Uh, uh, some skepticism on both sides of the aisle that says we need to look into this stuff and made to find out if our if our election process is indeed secure. Uh, there have been requests made to uh, Mr. Simon down down at the uh, down at the state as far as information on on voters uh, a, a voter uh, fraud, and he has declined to listen to the court order to release the information. So I, I guess. You know, if there was nothing, if there was nothing to look at, then I would think our, our Secretary of State, Mr. Simon, would uh, do the right thing, get the information out there, let the stuff be looked at, and uh, see just is there a problem? Because if you never look at, if you never do the investigation, you'll never find out what the facts really are. If you just keep going on this, uh, keep going on the oh everything's everything's uh, beautiful and smelling like roses. Well, eventually, folks, it, it, it will come back to bite us. So I would say, you know, I trust our, our area, Clearwater County, Lake of the Woods County, Beltrami County, but there are some things that need to be looked at as far as statewide, nationwide. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Additional comments, Reed? Yes. Um, I didn't know that Matt was such a big fan of Hillary Clinton. That's a big surprise to me. Um, uh, and in fact, that is the exact kind of canard that I'm talking about of trying to stoke doubt when there really isn't any there and doesn't need to be. Um, we have great safe elections. I, I'll say it again. We have the safest elections. We have the fairest elections. They are audited continually in Minnesota. There's always an audit after every election. Every, every county runs their own audit. Um, we know we have clean, fair, safe elections and I just again think it's incredibly irresponsible to try to cast doubt on the Minnesota election process. Thank you. Matt. Not a fan of Hillary Clinton. So I, I, get, your, I get your little sense of humor there. <laughs> but if both sides are saying that there's something wrong then it should be looked into. And like I said our, areas, our area has been pretty solid. Beltrami County, Clearwater County, and Lake of the Woods County. But there are some issues that need to be addressed. Uh, and if, if both sides are saying it, I guess maybe we should probably listen. All right, thank you. We will move on to our next question from Nicole. As I'm sure you're both aware, there is a distinct housing shortage in Northern Minnesota, both of uh, affordable housing and of market rate housing. So if you go down to the legislature in St. Paul, how would you work to encourage the development of both of those types of housing in 
both our region and other areas of greater Minnesota. Matt? Who's got this one? I do? Matt, okay. yes. <laughs> Lost track there for a second. That's it. You know, the housing, the housing uh, it's, it, it's tough all over the place right now. Um, when you have so much, uh, when, when things, costs are so high and it, it makes everything difficult, and when you have so many regulations that eat away and add expenses to uh, afford building houses and making, that, making it affordable, that, that makes it even tougher. So to get state government out of the way, to get rid of some of these regulations that are hindering our, our, uh, our home builders from building and then also making, building a house so that it can be affordable for, for a family to move into, for a family to start out in. You know, and it's all the way around. You know, this year we're talking about uh, low rent housing, but we're just talking about housing in general. The state has got to get out of the way and let these, and let these uh, folks do the building. We've got, we've got regulations coming out our ears that eats away at, at so much of, of uh, increases the cost of housing, whether it be, whether it be uh, apartments, whether it be uh, single family homes, all of it. The state has got to cut back on, uh, rein in the regulations, uh, do the things that need to be done, but quit increasing the costs, costs on, on, on their citizens so much. Thanks, Matt. Reed. Yes, I, I do agree that we do need to take a look at, at regulations and see if we have unnecessary regulations, but it is important to know that some of the regulations are there for safety reasons, uh, and uh, we, we need to make sure that homes are being built to a safe standard. Um, that being said, you know, again, I, I work uh, I, with the homeless. I uh, run a, a homeless shelter, and I, I know in our communities we do not have enough housing. Um, when I was door knocking up in, in the small town of Williams uh, in Lake of the Woods, they said that they needed more housing. Um, here in Bemidji, we talked about the need for more housing. Um, on Red Lake, we need more housing. So I think that we can do several different things to try to increase the production of housing. One, we can put more money into the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency to try and finance more profit, more projects for supportive housing. I think we can look at nonprofits to do supportive housing. And maybe one other way to reduce the cost of housing is for that for supportive housing is to take away the profit motive and have housing built and ran by people whose mission is to house people. Um, that's not to say that we don't have a lot of, of, of need for market rate housing. I know in Bemidji, uh, we have sometimes issues hiring professors and doctors um, uh, because we don't have adequate housing stock um, at the top tier. You know, you can talk to Dave Hangel at, at Greater Bemidji. He'll say one of the main things that is keeping development from occurring in Bemidji is lack of housing. Um, so it's an economic development tool. It's a quality of life tool. We need more housing in Bemidji, uh, in, in all of the communities in the district. Um, and I think we can get there. But we do have to figure out ways to incent uh, developers to come to Bemidji, to, um, to Bedette, to Williams, to Clearbrook, and get more housing built at all levels, at all income levels. Thanks. Thanks, Reed. Matt, additional comments? You know, I, I guess uh, just, a, just a couple. I mean, it boils down to this, folks. We need to get the state government out of the way so that we can build houses, adequate housing, whether it's low rent or whether it's uh, first time home buyers, single family homes or, or apartments. We need to get the government out of the way, get the regulations under control and to just to uh, randomly pour more money into it is not a good way to do it. We need to make sure that what we are doing is going to have the best effect across the board. Um, when you talk about uh, when you talk about uh, de-incentivizing the the uh, uh, anybody making a profit, you know these home these these uh, these housing providers these uh, uh, as you, a lot of people call them landlords and a lot of people call them worse than that, but these housing providers are there doing a good service, and if we eliminate a lot of the regulations that. Uh, hinder them and cause them to have to increase prices, all of it, then we can also uh, help people to find adequate housing and affordable housing that way as well. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Read comments? Yeah, um, yes, uh, we, um, it's not just, uh, uh, 
it's, I, I'm not saying that we should remove them from, I'm just saying that for uh, supportive housing that we should maybe look at a different model. Um, the other thing that I would, I would look at too is uh, equity firms coming in and gobbling up homes wholesale and then turning them into rentals. It's getting it harder and harder for young families, young people to be able to buy starter homes because they're getting scooped up by people, by, by firms, by speculators and turned into rentals. The, the rent then is jacked up. This is starting to happen here in Bemidji. Um, it's a national problem. And so we have to figure out ways that we can get starter family homes to homesteaders, to people that want to, to live in their homes and not just sell it to, uh, to um, equity firms. And as we see the interest rates rise, it's gonna be harder and harder for people to be able to get into the homes that are there because the, the mortgage payments are gonna be so high. So we do really have to figure out a, a solution there to the, to the interest rates and we have to try to keep these equity firms from coming in and scooping up all of the housing in, in communities like ours. Thank you. As a reminder, if we do need that additional minute of time, if you can't quite get it all in there, just flag me down and we'll make sure you get that. Next question, Dennis. This will be a viewer question. We, we uh, ask viewers to send us their questions. This year we had more viewer questions than ever before, close to 50. So we thank all our viewers for their interest in the debates. And this viewer would like to know how you would address gun violence as a public safety issue. Reed. Well, I'll, I guess I'll quick start by saying, you know, this is Northern Minnesota. We are hunters, we all own guns. I own guns, I hunt. Um, I, am, I think that we can do a lot uh, as far as, you know, red flag laws um, and uh, have universal background checks. And I think that can help us out quite a bit. Um, another, I think sometimes we falsely look at mental health as a cause of gun violence. It's not always, but I think that investing again in mental health <laughs> can help, um, help some, stem some of that. Um, it's, a, it's a tough issue. There's a lot of guns in America. You know, um, there's a lot of guns in places where people aren't out hunting <laughs> um, for deer or, or pheasants. You know? So um, it is a very difficult uh, issue for us to, 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 um, to really deal with in America because we do have such a, a, a strong gun culture. Um, and uh, I think that we just can look at, at background checks as a good start and, see, and, um, and try and keep guns out of, out of kids' hands. Thanks, Reed. Yep. Matt. You know, uh, it's a good question, and gun violence, it's, it's not the gun, folks. It's not the gun, it's the person holding the gun, and that's, uh, and that's it every time. Um, when you talk about when my when my opponent here talks about red flag and universal background checks we already do background checks there's not a criminal around that can legally purchase a firearm uh, in the state of minnesota because of their because it it the background checks are done there is no way that to, there's no way for them to be able to uh, circumvent that system the red flag and the universal background checks they will only hinder they will only hinder the law-abiding citizen. That is the only, those are the only people that, that will stop, that, that will be, be hurt by uh, red flag laws or universal background checks. Law-abiding citizens to make it more difficult for them to go out and purchase a, purchase a firearm. The gun violence, like I said, this is a, it's a, it's a problem right along with, uh, with every other violent crime that has increased in the state of Minnesota. Why is that increased? Is that is because we have we have uh, taken the foot off of uh, off of the gas as far as holding uh, violent criminals accountable. A criminal is, is going to find a way to to get a firearm, to get a knife, to get a club, whatever they whatever they use to for to commit their act of violence. They will lie, cheat, steal, and and trade for narcotics for whatever to get a firearm, to get whatever weapon they need. And that's not gonna change. Making more laws uh, for, for law-abiding citizens is not going to change how criminals go about uh, finding, uh, finding uh, weapons. The violence period has got to be a heart change and, and a mind change uh, of the citizens in, the, in our society. And that is where it's, it's gotta start. It's gotta start right with each one of us 
to, to have that change. Thanks, Matt. Read additional comments? Yeah, I always find it odd when people say that uh, a, a law against something doesn't keep someone from breaking that law, so why bother having the law? Um, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But I do agree that we do need to um, have a, you know, a, society that, a society that has the gun violence that we do, whether there's a lot of guns available or not, is not a healthy society. If we are a healthier society, then we wouldn't have the violence that we do. But, uh, but we, we will benefit from having, we do benefit from having background checks, and we would benefit from having certain red flag laws. Matt? Thanks. I guess if you want to, if you want to start to infringe on, on our citizens' constitutional rights, uh, the right to keep and bear arms, that uh, red flag law is one of the best ways to do it. Um, we do have laws in place. We do have universal, or we do have background uh, checks in place already, and there is not uh, there is not a way for a criminal to legally purchase a firearm in Minnesota. Uh, like I said. They will st they'll steal these guns. They'll trade for these guns in, in the black market. That's not going to go away, and that's something that we have to fight against. Again, again, violent crime overall is, is, on, a, is on a very, very massive increase uh, across the nation and in this state, and it has to be reined in. But we have, to be, we have to be willing to allow our law enforcement personnel to do their job unhindered and without uh, fear of, of being punished for for doing their for executing the, the the very laws that we have put on the books for them, we've got plenty of laws, folks. We don't need new ones. Thanks, Matt. We're going to have one last question, but I'm going to change it up just a smidgen. We're going to answer just once and no rebuttal or no additional comments. So you still get two minutes for the answer, but no additional comment time. Heidi. Give us an example of how you have worked and communicated with tribal nations and how you will foster relationships if you are elected to the representative as the representative for 2A. Matt. Well, I have worked, uh, I have worked with the, the Red Lake Nation, uh, like I said, uh, first in law enforcement capacity for, for, for many years and more recently as a, as a state legislator. Uh, the, the work that I got done uh, on the Red Lake Nation was uh, there was a need for uh, room uh, for expansion of the elementary school there. And so my, my legislation got the funding for them and it was bipartisan work. And I worked alongside with the, with the school and, and tribal officials to make sure that it, w it met what they wanted to do. When you go and tour a school and there are small children having to uh, attend class in a broom closet or utility room that's been converted into a classroom, and when they're talking about having to uh, uh, so much, uh, not having enough room for kids to be able to eat lunch and having to sit up on the stage or having to uh, eat in shifts and things like that, that's ridiculous. When you're talking about uh, unsafe uh, areas for them to get, on, to get on and off the school buses, that's something that's got to be, that's got something that had to be changed and I got it changed. And I will continue to do that kind of work. More recently, uh, the, the uh, uh, funding for ICW uh, in, in child welfare, where they wanted to take and uh, bring the out-of-home placement back into the responsibility of the Red Lake uh, Red Lake Nation, that was that was helped along, and we got that done. And we worked together bipartisan work again to help get that done. But the funding for that uh, for the building there that they needed to uh, so they could do that work, well, that came from my work as well. I made sure that after, after that, uh, that uh, piece of legislation got kicked aside by Governor Walls and his administration, I picked it up and I got bipartisan support for it immediately. We got that passed, we got it across the finish line so that now, now the Red Lake Nation has a facility to not only take care of the children, uh, uh, to, to take care of the auto home placement of their own children, but it also, it also gives the families a place to go and heal and grow and mend as well. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Reed. Yeah, as a Beltrami County Commissioner, I've worked with the Red Lake Nation for uh, for about s for six years um, in as as a commissioner. In fact, I, I was down testifying um, to the to one of the Senate committees for for uh, helping Red Lake Nation become an initiative tribe, as Matt was referring to, um, taking over the out of, out of home placement administration. Um, 
I also work with the Red Lake Nation almost every day, and uh, and and offices at Red Lake, at uh, Leech Lake, and uh, and White Earth um, through the the shelter program that I operate. So I'm working with Jordan May and the in the Red Lake Shelter. Um, I work with uh, housing, Red Lake, uh, sorry, Leech Lake housing all the time, trying to get people where they need to go. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the, of the debate, I am endorsed by the Red Lake Nation. They trust me, they know that I've worked hard for their, um, for their uh, uh, interests. I fully support uh, tribal sovereignty and the treaties that we have with the nations. And I can't wait to get to St. Paul to be able to further um, uh, uh, support their efforts uh, uh, at the legislature. <coughs> Thank you. We're gonna move right into closing comments then. You get two minutes each. Uh, Reed? Close us out. I'm just going to say my opening statement again because I thought it was really good. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, all right. Hey, um, yeah, I do want to thank you, Bethany, and the panel, and uh, Lakeland News and the sponsors for this opportunity. Um, I hope you can see now a, a bit of a contrast between between Mr. Grossel and myself. And just want you to know that I, I want to continue to invest in rural Minnesota and improve the quality of life for everyone. Um, I want to improve our roads. I want to improve our, our housing and get more access to, um, to mental health care. Um, I, I see a bright future for northern Minnesota. Um, and I don't want to wallow into in the uh, fear and divisiveness that so often grips politics in, in our nation these days. Um, I will work with Republicans and Democrats to pass effective legislation for the benefit of the district. Um, I'm not a partisan ideologue. Um, I, I will not sacrifice my community and blind service to my, to my caucus. Many of you know me, and you know that I am in public office to improve my community. Um, I've received, received zero dollars from, from corporate PACs. My campaign is purely driven by, um, some, by, in, by donations from individuals, um, a little bit of support from some tribes and some unions. Um, and I, I also am known as someone that gets things done. You know, when I saw too many people dying on Bemidji streets, I worked with other people to build a shelter. You know, when I had a hard time matching people staying at our shelter up with uh, the services that they needed, I opened um, up a day center. I identify problems and I fix them. And I don't do this alone. I accomplish my goals by working with people, often whom I don't agree with uh, uh, ideologically. But we collaborate and we work on things where we have common cause and we put aside our ideological differences to argue some other time. We need a champion for the district. My name is Reed Olson and with your support I will be the next, uh, your next state representative and together we will make our communities better and improve the quality of life for all rural, Mer uh, rural Minnesotans. Thank you very much and I humbly ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thanks Reed. Matt, closing comments. Thank you, panel, and uh, thank you all you folks who, who took the time to listen tonight. Uh, unlike my opponent, I will not, uh, I will not badmouth him. Uh, I'm glad he stepped up to run as a candidate for this office. Uh, I've been serving for six years, and I have, uh, uh, like I've always said, I have been here to serve. I've gotten a lot of things done for uh, different communities uh, as, long, as far as uh, resources that were needed for water and sewer projects from Black Duck to, to, to Clearbrook and, uh, and many other areas around. Uh, more recently, I've gotten the, like I said, the, the school funding for the Red Lake Elementary School and the school fund, or the funding for the uh, family center that was, that was built up there. Uh, and, and along with that, uh, when the Northwest Angle was cut off from, from uh, the rest of the United States as far as having access to it. I got the funding up, the emergency funding up there by working across the aisle and all these projects I'm talking about, I've worked across the aisle to get the support from both sides to make sure that this was done. But the emergency funding that was, went to the, to the uh, Northwest Angle to help those businesses survive, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. If you need help, then we're here to do that. And like I've said, I've been helping people uh, in this district, in this area, 
since 2000, since 2001, when I first put on the uniform of a police officer. And I don't, I, I don't uh, look at uh, anybody's uh, political background or the color of their skin. I look at the citizen that needs help. And those people that come forward and ask me for help, they know before they leave my office whether I can help them or not. So on November 8th, if you want uh, the continued service of your state legislator, then vote for, vote for me, Matt Grassel, uh, for the House of Representatives in District 2A. Thank you all. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you to the panel. Thank you for watching. If you missed any portion or would like to watch it again, it's online at the Lakeland PBS website within 24 hours. That website is lptv.org. The Bemidji Pioneer also has its voter's guide coming out on October 29th, and you can find additional election coverage on kaxe.org. Coming up in just a few minutes, we're gonna have District 2B with candidates Representative Matt Bliss and Erica Bailey Johnson. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Thanks. Lakeland News is member-supported content. Please consider supporting Lakeland News today.